welcome to The Ship Room, where we learn from tech leaders at some of the world's most successful companies. I'm Brad Anderson, I'm the Vice President of Microsoft 365. Today, we are joined by the CIO of Polaris, Matt Emmerich. Matt, welcome to the show. Hi, glad to be here. Polaris is synonymous with all-terrain vehicles. You know, I grew up riding Polaris snowmobiles. In between the 12,000 employees you have and the constant R&D and the factories and dealerships all over the world, there's a lot of infrastructure that probably people don't realize is required to make Polaris work. We have about 14,000 employees at Polaris. Um, and they're spread out in many different geographies and doing many different types of jobs. We actually uh, have put a really big focus on communication and collaboration. What was it like when Polaris had to, you know, because of the pandemic, go to work from home, shelter from home? We started um, seeing restrictions and knew that our employees were going to have to work from home. Um, we immediately turned on and immediately activated all of the capabilities that we had for them. So really in the, in the matter of about two days, we went from having uh, 4,500 office employees working in our buildings um, to having those people remote and we didn't miss a beat. I don't know that we would have been able to make such a seamless transition to work from home um, without the investments and the partnership that we've had with Microsoft over the last two to three years. Our employees are running purely on Office 365. Our files, our shares are um, in OneDrive and Azure. To be frank, as I, as I spoke with my, my CEO through this, um, he actually gave us a ton of credit and, 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 and commented about how seamless and how effective of the transition from office to working remote has been. Hey, it looks like we're getting a call on the team's phone. Welcome to the ship room. You're here with Matt. Ha <laughs> ha! Hi, Vina. Break out your finest barrel of wine. Tycho Brahe has arrived. I know what you're thinking, this is all a little bit random. And when I was 20, I lost my nose in, in a duel with my cousin because we were fighting over who was better at math during our friend's engagement party. So I had to wear this metal prosthetic the rest of my life. <laughs> Obviously. Brad, don't rush my intro. It takes a minute for me to set up the joke we're working towards. Oh, Brad, since you have someone there who literally works for the North Star. <laughs> you mean Polaris? Yes. Who knew such a thing was possible? Oh, I just want to double check some of my own measurements. So I'm going to show you a list of common constellations along with their traditional name. And you tell me if these are true constellations of the night sky or something that no good Kepler came up with. Aquila, the Thunderbolt Eagle. True. The golden hair of Queen Bernice. No way, that can't be right. For the record, that's... my grandmother's name was Bernice. Yes, Brad, that's who this was named after. And it is indeed real. The glorious metallic nose. <laughs> it's a hint. I named this one. If you named it, yes, it must be a true constellation. No, that was comedic deceit from me to you. I fooled you. <laughs> the fiery porcupine. No way. The half fish, half mammal, AKA goat of the sea. Real. Limax the slug. Fake. What's a slug look like? Is this like a, like, a, like a group of stars that all group together? Yes, it's a line of stars, but that line right there, the one you see, it is unmistakably slug-like. <laughs> Truly brilliant work. And this kind of knowledge is worth its weight in gold. One last question. One of the things the quarantine has really wreaked havoc on is a supply chain for most manufacturers. How can technology help close these gaps with things like automation, AI, and cloud-based tools? We of course used a lot of technology as we were trying to figure out where our supply chain is at and our distribution channel. Um, a lot of those tools, frankly, ended up for us to be low code and automation-based tools. So we were using RPA, we were using bots, really to figure out um, not only what's open and uh, which suppliers are going to be able to provide parts to our factories, um, but what do we actually need to build? And what do we need our suppliers to build? So all of those tools uh, helped us substantially. Of course, the data analytics was the other piece. Um, you know, using, uh, using Azure, using Power BI, uh, we took a lot of the bricks and a lot of the analytical models that we had, 
uh, tweaked them and uh, help are using those now to, to help us with sensitivities, using those to help us with variances and uh, and really new predictions in, in this COVID environment that we're going through. Yeah, that low code, no code option that the power platform brings, I think that's been a lifesaver for many of us because it's just so rapidly you can reinvent, if you will, or re-optimize your, your entire processes. And I think I think there are two big meta trends that we're going to see coming out of the pandemic. You know, the one is remote everything. But I think the other one is all about optimization of, of, of everything that we do. And I think most of us have seen that there are certain places where we've had constriction points and we've got to figure out how we optimize that. And, and the, these low code, no code solutions, I think are going to be core to that. I think the other thing that's coming out of this is that whether you were doing agile and being iterative, um, the pandemic and where we're at right now has really forced all of us to go there. You have to work in smaller increments. You have to be able to learn rapidly and be able to, um, to frankly, zig and zag your way to success. A few minutes ago, we talked about how technology can support innovation. I think culture is also a massive driver of innovation. So how do you and how you lead and how your team you know, brings technology to the organization? How do they do that in a way that helps accelerate the culture that then helps accelerate innovation? If you and I would have been talking about culture um, four or five years ago, I think yeah. I would have described our culture um, in with the words that we want to get it right um, and we want to make sure um, that we're hitting the mark and, and even words like perfection. And I think fast forward to where we're at now, we've really pivoted our culture within the IT department um, to be thinking a lot more about speed and agility. What that's meant is that, hey, let's talk about how do we do things in smaller increments? How do we make sure that we're listening not only to the customers, and to the stakeholders, but then progressing in smaller increments. And frankly, when you add the technology tools on top of it that allow us to work in smaller increments, um, that's really transformed how we can uh, how we can do our work. This is a time, I think, in, in, in how technology can impact culture like it never has it before, especially in, in this environment today where most of us are working from home. But it's technology that I think now has more impact on culture than it's ever had before. And I certainly, I, I take a look at culture in a completely different way than I did prior to Satya becoming the CEO of Microsoft, because his primary focus internally has been on the culture and how the culture and this concept of a growth mindset drives innovation. Back in college, you, you basically paid for school by running a vegetable stand, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, that's exactly how I paid for college. I ran a roadside vegetable stand out of the back of a pickup truck. I'm gonna put all of your knowledge of that market to the test. So what I'm gonna show you here is I'm gonna show you a real piece of produce and there's gonna be a price on it. What I want you to tell me is the real price higher or lower than the price you see on the picture. Let's do it. The first one is called Decopon Oranges. This is a hybrid of a mandarin and an orange, and it dissolves when you bite into it. Are these higher or lower prices than $200 per a half dozen? They're lower, Brad. Yeah, you're right. They're $79 for a half dozen, but still $79. All right, the next is a Ruby Roman grape. Each grape is the size of a ping pong ball and has it has an 18% sugar content. Are these higher or lower than $17 per grape? I think they could be higher. Man, you're good. $225 per grape. Wow. We didn't sell Ruby Roman grapes out of the pickup truck. No one will buy them. This is a premium Densuk watermelon. They only grow a hundred of these per year on Japan's northernmost island. Are these higher or lower than $5,000 each? I'm going to go higher. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> $6,100 for a 17 pound watermelon. I bet it tastes good. Last one here. A still life painting of some apples and pears. Painted by French Impressionist Paul Cezanne, and it is titled Pitcher and Fruit. Was this sold higher or lower than $33 million? I don't have any Cezannes in my art collection, but I'll say it's higher. <laughs> You're right, it, was, it sold for $59 million. You hit a perfect score. I guess the first time that's ever happened on the ship room, so hats off. Now, I also saw a really interesting way that you've been using technology to support the people working outside of the office. It's a power app that you created to schedule who's in and who's out of the building. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? As the restrictions uh, were, were happening with, uh, with COVID, um, we quickly knew that our employees were gonna be working remote. We also knew that as an essential business, we're gonna have some employees that need to come into our offices. We 
focused on employee safety and health. And what we decided is that we needed an app. And what we were really looking for through this app was the ability to know who has to come into the office. When are they going to be in the office? Are they healthy? Can we help that employee actually understand some of the best practices and what they're looking for? Um, and then ultimately, the information that we're using out of the app is allowing us to understand building occupancy, deploy the right social distancing measures, just helping our, helping our employees stay safe and healthy. One of the things we do in the ship room is we have AI listening into our conversation. And the, the AI actually comes up with the 12 most pertinent questions that, um, that's related to the topics that you and I have spoken about. All right, so which of these two remodels would you rather do to your house? Building a larger closet or putting in a hot tub that can actually do time travel? Hot tub, for sure. Who's the first celebrity that comes to mind when you say snowmobile? Levi LaValle. Clara specializes in power sports. What's the weakest sport? Does all terrain really mean all terrain? I'm thinking like lava. Do it. What's your favorite Prince song? Purple Rain. It's been so great having you here. Thank you for taking the time to do this. I admire what Polaris stands for. I admire the work that you do there and the technology and the, and the transformation of the culture that you drive. Now, if people wanted to learn more about Polaris or more about you, where would they go? www.polaris.com. Thank you again for being with us. And for everybody, we'll see you the next time on The Ship Room. Knowledge is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> Actually, contrary to popular belief, this was made of brass, but you know, whatever, tomato, tomato. <laughs>